Welcome to the channel, everybody. Today, I'm going to be talking about LSD. Ever wonder how LSD works? So I'm going to read through an article. As I do, I'll put the link in the description. If anybody wants to check it out, it's from Big Think by Derek Barris. It's called Ever Wonder How LSD Works? An answer has been discovered. UNC School of Medicine researchers identified the amino acid responsible for the trip. This came out about a year ago, September 2020. There is a button to listen to the article, so you could probably hear people do it way better than me. And here are the points. Researchers at UNC School of Medicine have discovered the protein responsible for LSD psychedelic effects. A single amino acid, part of the protein, GAQ, activates the mind-bending experience. The researchers hope this identification helps shape depression treatment. And that's a real uh, motivation for why I did this, although I have done acid in the past. Um, you know, period of time in my life. I have been interested in the research they've been doing with lots of psychedelics, trying to see how they would help depression. I think it's a good thing not to say I equate it the same as marijuana, where I would say make marijuana legal, so on and so forth. Most drugs should be legal in a sense. And you're finding that with this stigma and this fake war on drugs bullshit, that you get benefits from these things, that we could use them to help us. So like I said, the link will be in my description if you want to check it out, listen to someone do it professionally, but I'll read it through and then I'll just give some thoughts on it. I'll begin. Shortly after Albert Hoffman's famous bicycle trip, the Swiss chemist harrowing ride home after accidentally dosing himself with the then unknown LSD-25. And what is it again? It's lysergic acid diethylamide? That's what it stands for? His laboratory, Sandoz, shipped this peculiar substance to any researcher willing to investigate its potential uses. Hoffman is responsible for dosing the planet with his ergoline derivative, as well as all the creativity and rituals that have sprung up around it. 98, or oh, nearly eight decades, and many thousands of studies later, researchers have been unable to identify the chemical responsible for LSD's unique results. We know that the tryptamine derivatives like LSD and psilocybin bind to serotonin 2A receptors, resulting in the mystical experience, as well as the serotonin 1A receptors, which cause feelings of contentment. How LSD accomplished this, accomplishes its magical feats, though, have remained a mystery. A little piece of that mystery appears to have been solved, thanks to a new study, there's a link here by the way, published in the journal, cell leading author Brian Roth a professor and pharmacologist at the University of North Carolina School of Medicine says decades of targeted research on LSD have now come to fruition. Hundreds of clinical trials on psychedelics occurred in the 50s and 60s before this class of substance got caught in the crosshairs of a racist political front. Even the government was experimenting with psychedelics. The notorious Project MKUltra lasted for two decades when an unknown number of Americans, the homeless, minorities, immigrants, unknowingly dosed with LSD so researchers could observe its behavioral effects. Ouch. Back in the world of clinical science, LSD has always showed promise. That trend continues as restrictions are finally easing up. Understanding LSD's effect on our brain's complex system of networks is an important step toward discovering therapeutic actions, as Roth says of his research. Quote, now we know how psychedelic drugs work, finally. Now we can use this information to hopefully discover better medications for many psychiatric diseases. End quote. Using X-ray crystallography, Roth's team discovered a single amino acid, a building block of the protein GAQ, responsible for binding to serotonin receptors. As LSD is only a partial Agonist, they also experimented with full organist design a psychedelic in order to observe comple complete receptor activation. 
This amino acid appears to be the master switch for the psychedelic experience. While psilocybin has been in the news, the psychedelic resistance renaissance is expanding in all directions. Phase 1 clinical trials on the combination of LSD, MDMA, and psychotherapy will soon commence. LSD's effect on major depressive disorder and pain management are ongoing, with the first psychedelics company to IPO on the American stock market, along with hundreds of millions of dollars of investment flowing into similar companies and organizations to push for legalized psychedelic psychedelics intensifiers. And behind that, all right, I'll continue. Researchers are actively attempting to remove the hallucinogenic component of psychedelics for widespread therapeutic usage. Trials using ibogaine for addiction treatment, for example, identifying the chemical effects of psychedelics on our brains is an essential step in that process. Of course, believing psychedelics only matters to brain chemistry is problematic as well. The rituals associated with their use are just as relevant. The set and setting model espoused by Timothy Leary reminds us that biology isn't everything. Environmental factors play just as an important role in mental health. Isolating specific chemicals without understanding the impact of the drug and the environment overlooks the holistic nature of the psychedelic experience. For example, ketamine trials were rushed and could potentially backfire. We can't afford to make that mistake again. Still, understanding the pathways LSD utilizes is an important step forward. As Roth says, our ultimate goal is to see if we can discover medication, medications which are effective, like psilocybin, for depression, but do not have the intense psychedelic actions. In a world where more people are growing anxious and depressed by the day, every intervention should be explored. So, this is another thing that caught my attention. I have done LSD, I do mushrooms, for the most part I just smoke weed, I don't even drink that much, but over the years I've felt the benefit and it's one of those personal things, you know, you don't um, just go on that alone, but it's good to see the research into what can help people because for me I would take a two-prong approach growing up uh, and becoming an adult was playing Dungeons and Dragons, which is a role-playing tabletop game, which keeps you focused on things, your brain working, but it's almost in its way, its own meditation, smoking weed. And it's not that escapism where you're just playing a video game and, you know, time is passing by. But I always found that to be a good way to have friends come and get away from their problems and let their brains work on things in a different way through different outlets, because our brains are really complicated. And doing certain drugs, I've always noticed, uh, uh, well, now it's maybe, you know, repetitive to say, but there's a, there's patterns of um, a restarting, uh, um, you know, they're saying the psilocybin, it's doing things to the brain that is resetting everything, and it's giving people hope of battling PTSD, depression, even suicidal uh, thoughts, and the whole gambit is at least open. I think there was a big mistake on the war on drugs. It was a big scam. It's all bullshit. I think we need to examine them. I'd rather learn about them, know about them, than it being some taboo thing you grow up as a kid. And when I was younger, I was going through everything my mother had, pills, whatever I can find. Um, and that was starting at whatever age, 13, 14, growing up. And for me, maybe I'm a little lucky in, in a certain way, the, my genetics and my environment. I've tried almost everything on the planet, but I just like to smoke some weed. I don't drink. I rarely drink every, you know, once every now and then. And I like to do mushrooms when I go camping and do that, uh, several times a year, but not, not much. It's, it's not really available. But again, this bullshit war on drugs, at least now we're seeing some of this alleviate and do it the right way. Like it said about the ketamine trials, you can't rush these things because we see certain aspects and, oh, I like doing E or, you know, whatever. You have to at least see the data, you have to do research, peer review, 
the whole kit and caboodle. So this is uh, the pathways we have now. We can treat it with a little more respect. Don't make it so taboo. Do the real science on it. And you find things like this, like we find the chemical marks, the amino acid. Who knows what will happen. They'll make a pill that is working like LSD, but it doesn't get you high or give you a trip, quote unquote. Where we go from here is, uh, you know, there's no limit. But we can't always just put our foot down, drugs are bad, don't talk about it with our children, don't let them know about it as they're growing up, because they're going to find them going into their friend's garage and smoking weed or trying pills. I'd rather talk to my children about these things, and if we can get that society going, we can get real scientists and government and laws that allow very distinguished doctors, researchers, look into it. Because our mental health is important. It's really important to everybody. We don't, I don't think we take it serious enough as humans on this planet. There's so much craziness going on, and we are just like little machines that we are mimicking our parents and love my parents in a, in a way and family, but if it's wrong at the foundation, it gets passed down wrong. I'll say it again. I've said it a lot on uh, some of my podcasts. I believe children should be taught breathing exercises as early as possible. And as you document their cognitive development, you start teaching them about meditations and how to deal with their thoughts and feelings. When it's just... um. It's like chaos out there. In any case, more studies. I don't care what drugs it's on, uh, what stigma it has. If we're going to find something that could help people, and I don't mean just, you know, risking danger, going to get uh, heroin off somebody, but if we can alleviate that on a large scale with real good research... I think you're going to improve society, improve the country, improve the world. And even if it's a fraction and you build on that, get the studies going wide, get everybody looking at it as um, a legitimate thing and not some taboo, we can't touch this, drugs are bad. And I get it, you know, social media is bad. And you look at people's, the way our brains work. I was talking to a friend about this who just... um took a break from social media. There are certain people, it's the way we're geared to learn things, the shortcuts our brains make. We look for, you know, um, acceptance and um, feelings from the internet. We're scrolling, we're looking, and you're just playing into this, this uh, plan, so to speak, as my friend was talking about. And you got to think about it from that, perspective i always say if you're dealing with things like criminals always give them the benefit that they're good at what they do right so you you gotta think like oh i'm gonna be outsmarted well that's the same thing with society and politicians and you don't think they have great psychiatrists great neurologists they understand how to spread these ideas and memes or how to get people hooked on social media Now, personally, I don't think it's such a major thing. I think we will adapt and come out better on the other side. But it's smart to be aware of these things. So everything we can use in abundance, we can take things and use them always. We can always go overboard and abuse them. And you can play the word game and say you can do that with love and attraction. and right, It can get, get ramped up. So I think it's time to end the war on drugs and start the research into drugs find out what it can do who it can help do it right ethics and efficacy and everything you need to do we got great improvements in neurology and psychiatry and understanding evolutionary biology we got lots of uh you know things about our environment that we're understanding more and more let's put it to use let's stop this stigma stop the bullshit Get the information, get the data, work with it, expand it, 
So I am so happy about things like this, and that's why an article like this catches my attention. And like I said, yeah, I don't think if someone gave me an answer right now, I would do it. But if someone gave me mushrooms, they damn right. And you got these micro dosing. I use a vaporizer as medicine for my weed. So in general, I'll have a, um, you know, I don't get expensive weed, and I'll get some uh, tobacco and make a thing, and I'll smoke a bowl, a bong, uh, roll it in uh, backwards or, you know, leaf or whatever. But I put a certain amount of pure weed into my vape chamber, and I start it at low temperature, and I keep going up. So I take like three, five-minute doses a day, just vaping weed, and it has done wonders for me. I had a friend make me oils in a little pill. He would put it in fucking pills, I swear. You know, like you take those pill capsules and you could spread them apart. And, and, and I don't know, I guess you get a needle and whatever. He made this, uh, oh man, I wish I knew exactly what it was. It was like a, a vegetable oil, glycerin type thing. And I would take two of the pills and when I made tea at night, I would put it in my tea. I've never had better sleep in my life. Aches, pain, subside. And maybe for me, it's a little more beneficial because I'm someone who meditates and practices uh, breathing exercises. So for someone like me who has a toothache or a headache and I could breathe and meditate and kind of um, uh, hold it at bay or alleviate it, maybe it works better for me because there's always outliers. But Let's keep an open mind. Let's keep the research going. Let's just make people better, make society better and more healthy. So here's everybody's mental health. I hope you're doing well. And I'll see you all next time. My best to you and you.